Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. Welcome back to another episode of the Fisher Edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons for new players. This episode we're going to focus on the, the Ranger class, which is technically a subclass in first edition of the Fighter. So before we get any further uh, along into detail, let's get our board ready. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about first edition is they changed how the Ranger functioned in all the subsequent editions. Uh, so it was considered a subclass of the Fighter in first edition, and in later editions, it's like considered like a subclass of the rogue and the thief and all this kind of stuff. It's really tricky. Uh, there's all kinds of special rules for which ones can dual wield, who can't dual wield. Um, but the ranger itself, the first edition, is really kind of uh, heavily influenced by the character Strider from Lord of the Rings. Let's just put this little unpainted, unmounted, very cool little mini we picked up for a dude with a bow. So you think of a ranger, what do you think of? You think of Strider or Aragorn and the guy with a bow and maybe a longsword wearing leather armor. Um, you don't think of someone with a pet. Uh, you think of someone who knows the woods really well. Um, and that's pretty much kind of how it is. Uh, but there's a lot of subtle details in first edition that you may not realize. Let's go through that. So open up your PDF to page 24. We'll just get right into it and uh, start talking about the details. We'll use a little night down uh, soundscape in the background here. This is the actual map from uh, Glacier Rift or Frost Giant. Draw the White Dragon Lair. Uh, this is a mated pair of white dragons in a lower level. This is a huge, massive cavern. There is a large shelf that goes up like this, a massive, huge treasure hoard here. Um, I just to give you a sense of how big our party used to use this location to camp a lot. So we have Zolaris and uh, Felcherna and Vringar and all that kind of business here, Mercedes. And these are large floor to ceiling stone pillars. This is north is always top for you. This is an uh, area to the west that leads the rest of the dungeon and big pile of bones. There is an opening, a sinkhole opening, goes up where the Remorhaz was, and when they played, they fell down in here. So we we'll just use this as a little battle map for our conversation with this massive treasure hoard or what have you. But we'll use this unpainted mini to kind of represent our ranger when we're talking about things. So we start throwing stuff on the board like the winter wolves or whatever like that for examples. Uh, we'll use the ranger. And of course, we have one inch equals five foot squares, it's a typical battle map. So on page 24, let's just take a look right away at what the details are here. Um, I'm going to zoom this in just a little bit. On the, it's kind of funny because, you know, these two column layouts, of these books, they don't do a hard return on every page. Um, so the beginning of a class doesn't get a grand picture. I mean, this is back in the standard blue line publishing era. <clears throat> this, isn't, this stuff is not laid out by computer. These books are laid out on actually by st double stick tape on grid paper. Ten, I mean, very traditional publishing method. So... You see stuff that's kind of in a Helvetica font. It's not real fancy, but there's a lot of really good design ideas in here. So right down here in the lower left corner, let's just zoom in a little bit here, let you see what we're talking about. Right here, let's look at this paragraph right here, okay? So Rangers are a subclass of fighter who are adept at woodcraft, uh, tracking, scouting, and infiltration and spying. So you're basically like an outdoor thief, so to speak, or a scout. That makes a lot of sense. You think of Strider and Aragorn and Lord of the Rings, and he's a run running around and disappearing and helping Mr. Underhill and all that kind of business. So um, although they can be lawful, uh, chaotic or neutral otherwise, a ranger must have strength not less than 13, intelligence not less than 13, wisdom of not less than 14, and 14 or, t or greater constitution. This is something that they did a lot of in the first edition. Um, they, uh, they, let's put this over so you can see a little better. They made it so... The subclasses required more statistical specifics as opposed to um, just being a fighter. Like being a fighter, you need this much strength, that's it. There's no additional. So there's a lot of statistical requirements to play a ranger. So if you're rolling a character, you can play an illusion, you need dexterity, things like that. So it's not a charisma-based class or anything like that. It's kind of like a druid, but the ranger, the ranger in first edition is not very druidic until very high level. And by the time you become dru you have druidic spells, they're not that useful. Um, there are some basic things about the ranger that are very, very cool, especially with the bonuses against giants and things like that. And we're going to dig into that next. So remember, in first edition, this happens a lot. These senses that restrict like what alignment you can be, what races you can be, and what stats you need to be. At. Um, so, and one other rule that you've heard, you probably picked up on our episodes is that you know when you have a, a strength higher than the requirement. In this case, the required strength is what uh, a strength not less than thirteen. But if you have fifteen strength. In intelligence and wisdom, you get a benefiting 10% experience point awarded by the referee. You know, that rule is kind of, 
sure. If, if, I mean, it's not something like, oh, no, did you remember to give me the experience post bonus because I have blah, blah, blah statistics? Uh, it's, I, you know, most DMs like to award experience to people based upon how well they play and what they do as opposed to uh, just statistics that you have on a character sheet because they want you to play. You know, how you're playing the game is what's going to make a big difference. Let's just go up here to this other column and uh, make it easier to see here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. Okay, we're going to go up to the right-hand side of that column here on 24. There we go. So here's where we get into the details. Unlike other fighter types we're reading up here now, uh, Rangers have eight-sided hit dice. You know, hit dice is an infinite word that's been in the game forever. It just means how, what, you know, which die do you roll to roll for your hit points, right? So fighters are getting a D10, and uh, thieves are getting D6, Rangers are getting D8, Druids are getting D8, magic users and illusions are getting D4, which is really weak. Monks only get a D4. Um, so, you know, when you're rolling your hit points, you're going to have to, you're only going to be using an eight-sided die, right? Let's just put all these bad boys out here for fun. Can't believe I got this bag at Dragon Lair in Austin like 12 years ago. Um, so, you know, immediately, one of the first things you're going to notice when you're playing a ranger, you're going to sacrifice health because you're no longer a frontline fighter anymore. You're no longer, you're going to have other abilities. So the D8 is going to be what you're going to use to uh, roll your hit dice. Um, also, we know the rangers have a, get 11 hit dice rather than nine other fighter types. Now, that's a rule you'd be like, what do you mean by that? Do I get 11 as opposed to nine? The first edition had a lot of funky rules for how, how high level you could become. Um, what What's the maximum level you could become in, in the game? And so a lot of those types of things are uh, you don't you probably aren't really going to use them that much. Um, most people don't use them. Most of those rules have faded away over the years. So I wouldn't really worry about that. I think one thing, the way to play to have fun is don't give any kind of a restriction like, oh, you can't get beyond level eight and you only get one hit point for every level after eight. Just give them another hit dice. I like max hit points personally. Max hit points of monsters. That depends how you want to play. Um, so that I wouldn't w get too bogged down with those kind of details. But um, they're considerable prowess as a fighter. Rangers have druidic and magical spell capabilities when they attain high level. So very formidable opponents. They have other abilities that benefit just as well. Now we're going to get into what they can actually really do. When fighting humanoid type creatures, okay? So what do you guys, what's a humanoid type creature? How about this? Orcs. So orcs or bugbears or kobolds. And that's what they mean when they say humanoid. You're fighting evil dwarves. You're fighting drow. You're fighting ogres. Things are bipeds, bipedal creatures, not four-legged monsters that have, uh, you know, are carrion crawlers and uh, displacer beasts and those types of things. Those things are not humanoid. Humanoid means resembling a human being. Um, of the giant class listed hereafter, rangers had one hit point for each level of experience they have attained to the point of damage scored when they hit melee combat. So if you're a level 10 ranger and you nail a hill giant with a double bow shot or something like that, and you're level 10, you're going to add 10 to that damage roll. So if you had a, a bow damage of 3, that's going to be a 13. Now, you're not going to get a strength bonus, right? If you're using a bastard sword and go up and hit him with a bastard sword, you're going to get that damage bonus as well. So um, now it says melee combat. One thing we used to do, we played, is we allowed it to work with ranged combat and i think it's only fair um because you're supposed to be a master of a hunt master of using different bows living in the woods shooting accurately know how to do kill shots properly and uh, when you're fighting against these other humanoids which are defilers of the landscape and the forest you are you especially know how to fight them better than others they're considered your adversaries so that's a really nice bonus in first edition for the ranger um, so that means things like bugbears ettins giants gnolls here's the little list right here Hobgoblins, kobolds, ogre magi, thank goodness, orcs, and trolls. For example, um, a fifth level ranger hits a bugbear in melee combat and damage done to the opponent according to the ranger's weapon type modified by strength and plus five for his experience level. So that's a really, really nice damage bonus. So in essence, if you're a level 10 ranger, it's almost like wearing a girdle of, uh, what is it, a hill giant strength or something like that? That's like having a free magic item. That's really a big deal in first edition. That's a lot of extra damage. In fact, let's just take a look at this. Here's a, let's take a look at Mercedes. Mercedes is a level 12 fighter in our campaign, right? And let's just pull this out a little bit here so you can see a little bit better. Let's go to this uh, player panel. There we go. Sorry, that was off center. I mean, her damage is she's using a two handed sword as a right hander. So against regular people, a regular person, she attacks some, you know, 
Templar Knight that comes after her in Mediterranean, she's going to do 1d10 plus 5. That plus 5 comes from the weapon, the plus 4 weapon, and it comes from plus 1 from strength. She gets plus 1 strength for damage bonus because of her strength. Just a pure, basic melee swing. That is it. It is. She is not going to hit harder. When she hits level 13, she's not going to hit any harder. When she's level 20, she's not going to hit any harder. So she may attack more often, and she may end up ultimately getting better magic items, but she will ultimately be consistently kind of capped on what her damage output is. It does not happen for the ranger. Every time the ranger is gaining a level, they're getting one additional damage. So if you're using a, if, if ranger was using the same kind of weapon she was using, Okay, um, the ranger would do the same damage as her, but it would be a lot more. So let's say, say that say that Mercedes was a ranger. Okay, then her stats they probably meet the requirements, and the ranger is using a two-handed sword um, against a giant. Okay, uh, 3d6. That's the the two-handed swords in fifth edition have nerfed, but in the first edition, uh, two-handed sword does 3d6, one of those heaviest hitting weapons in the game because they're very very big. So you say you roll 3d6 damage. Two, two is four, plus three is seven. And say it was a plus four two-handed sword, so seven to four is 11. And then she's level 12. Add 12 to that. That's almost doubling the damage. That puts her up like 23 damage. That's nasty. That is something to consider for first edition. If you're, especially if you're a power gamer, if you're a little bit of a power gamer, you really want to nail things, you're going to be doing adventure like the, the giant against the giant campaign. You're going to be Greyhawk. You're going to be fighting orcs. You're going to do the village of Hamlet. If you know for a fact that you're going to be tied up in the, um, you know, some of the... Uh, uh, like slave pits in the Undercity, or you're going to be in the Ghost Tower of Inverness, or in Shirada Tomoishan. There's not a lot of these type of creatures and enemies to fight. It may not benefit you, but roll a ranger and play one because you like how they play, not just just to be power gamer for the one episode that you're going to fight. So here is another one. Rangers surprise opponents 50% of the time. A D6 score one to three. Well, you could do that anyway. You can want you could roll percentile dice and do the same thing. Um, you know, take out your ten-sided dice. And now these have just been pulled out of the bags. They're completely unorganized. Let's use the red ones here because I happen to see them. So say that, say that, let's, say, say, let's do the situation right here. Let's get these kids out of the way. Here's a hill giant in the cave. Everyone else not on the board. Rangers around the rock. Ranger sees the hill giant. Hill giant's just looking this way, right? Let's get our uh, marker out. So say this hill giant's standing guard, and he's just looking this way. He kind of sees over here. Maybe you can see out of the corner of his eye over here. Say the ranger comes running over this pile of bones and he sees him and he stands on top of the pile of bones and gets ready to take a shot at him. So that means that like normally what you do is you roll for initiatives. Like oh, I see you, you see me, let's see who's surprised. So we do the black dice for the bad guys and the color dice for the good guys. Maybe his dexterity reaction would, a bonus would make an effect. But despite all that, before you do anything, you check for surprise. So the ranger is guaranteed to surprise him. Um, in this situation, we rolled a 43, right? 50% of the time, that means he would surprise the hill giant. So that could have been anything. That could have been a Ramorhaz. That could have been a dragon. Um, that's pretty nasty. So that means that ranger's going to get the first move. They're going to get the first attack. Even the monk doesn't get this. Um, that's really, really powerful. If you're the kind of player that wants to run around and bumble into trouble, and you find yourself bumbling into trouble, you run around the court and, oh my goodness, there's a chimera there, you're going to probably surprise that creature because your movement, your ability to uh, be stealthy to a certain degree, just naturally moving quietly, um, your prowess at movement, I would say, would be the explanation for that ruling. There's nothing about the ranger magically. They're not like they're a rogue from World of Warcraft or stealth or anything like that. Um, so, and they themselves are only ever surprised on at, you know, 16, and who knows what that fraction is right here, it, basically a one in six. So what I would just say, you know, just make it 17% or 16%, this right here, read this rule number two. So let's say a situation happened in the game session where, um, let's just use these winter wolves, right? Say winter wolves were on this pile of bones and they're eating a bunch of junk. And let's say that you, um, you come running in the room this way, and you and the DM knows this guys are here. They don't see. He doesn't put them on the board yet, right? So the DM is like, okay, you come in the room. You see this big cavern. You're by yourself. There's none of your friends with you. You're you're being quiet. You're being stealthy. You're not doing anything too crazy. This is what you. This is your line of sight. Okay, so you can see, like this, and you can probably see a little bit over here, maybe out of the corner of your eye. So you can look left, look right, and you don't really see anything. That's because you can't see behind here, right? So. And say, okay, well, and say the DM describes something over here that's of interest to you. You start taking a step over this way. So the moment you step there, what that DM is going to do is he's going to pull out, well, you, uh, he may tell you, he may make a dramatic description of what's going on, or he just may throw these winter wolves down on the, on the board for you. And then you'd be like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do now? Let's get, these guys, let's get these kids back out. So it says there's a one, one winter wolf, right? So the winter wolf sees you, 
you're flat footed, you're not looking the right way. The DM could say, let's roll for surprise and give a bonus to him. Let's say that the Winter Wolf rolled a, let's see, let's say the Winter Wolf rolled a six, seven, eight, a nine, and let's say you rolled a two and a two and a one. Okay, so you lost the surprise roll. Then this rule kicks in, okay? They themselves, meaning the ranger, is only ever surprised 16% chance of the time. So the way I would rule this is I would say, roll the surprise check for you versus you, okay? And then if there's a reaction adjustment from your dexterity, you can add that in there if you want to. You can apply a dexterity bonus to this if you want to. Usually surprise is just a circumstance. Who sees who first? It's just head turning and retinas and vision. It's not really that big of a deal. Once that rule is determined, let's say this is the winner, then I would apply the ranger rule. And what you would do there is you would say, okay, well, there's only a 16% chance of him being uh, uh, ever surprised at all. So you could either do this as a percentile dial roll like this. So you'd roll this and you'd have to get a, you know, this would have to be a 10 and a 16 would be like something like this. This would be 16 right there. Or you could do like they suggest in the player handbook. You could say, oh, we'll just roll a d6. And uh, if you roll a one, I have to roll a one to surprise you. So with this entity is trying to uh, surprise this one. I have to roll a three. What would be fun to do as a DM or if you're the player, ask the DM to let you do the roll. Say, listen, I'm only ever surprised on a one six chance. Let me just roll a one and six chance to see if that happens. I roll a two. I'm not surprised. So now we're both equally see each other. No one's surprised. And then you could roll for initiative. So that's, a, you know, that's really powerful, really, really, really powerful. So not only are you going to get the first attack or the first move or the first opportunity to do something, even if you bumble into a room and you don't know what you're doing and you don't realize there's something in the room with you, you are not going to get caught flat-footed. So normally that winter wolf could have been like, boom, breath weapon, and you just find yourself taking tons and tons of breath weapon damage and cold, and you're having to make a saving throw. You might get nailed by this. It could one-shot you and kill you. You could get destroyed. But the odds are that's not going to happen. And so as a player, if that were to happen, you roll an initiative roll, you have a high dexterity usually as well. You probably win the initiative roll. You could do things like, well, I'm just going to take two steps here, move out of the way, the line of sight, and this thing's going to blast a winter a blast here. And so the winter wolf howls and starts doing its huge howling blast up effect, kind of like a, a death knight would in World of Warcraft, and you moved out of the way, so you're now protected. So you actually moved out of the way, and you didn't have to make a saving throw. So it depends, like, you know, how the DM wants to run things. What I like to do is... Uh, if the winter wolf is an animal, it's going to do what it's going to do. It's not going to change what it's going to do over the course of 500 milliseconds. It's going to see you. It's going to, hey, look, an invader in my den. I'm just going to go wham, use my most powerful weapon immediately right off the bat, even though it can only do it once per day. And the player is like, oh, crap, I know that's going to happen. Let me get out of the way. So really, really powerful. So the surprise one's really, really nasty. The damage bonus is nasty. It's not against everyone, okay? Humanoid-type creatures of the giant class. It doesn't mean drow. I think I said that earlier. That's wrong. Okay, let's go to number three. Tracking. Tracking is possible for both outdoors and underground. Really key element there. Okay, there's rules about playing a dwarf in first edition about being able to detect sloping passages and find workmanship of passages and detect moving passages and all this kind of cool stuff about dwarves. Well, you're playing a, a ranger. You're playing an elf ranger or a human ranger. So you have these other abilities. So underground... Um, the ranger must observe the creature to be tracked for three turns, 30 minutes and recommended. So this is a situation where like, Hey, listen, um, I've got this, uh, creature I want to track. Let's say it was, a uh, say it was, a uh, say it was a winter wolf and you're, you watched him and observed him for 30 minutes or a really long period of time. And then the creature moved off and you don't know where it is anymore. You could actually find out where it went by going in the room and exploring and then tracking and things like that. So, you know, and my whole Life playing first edition, no one's ever tracked anything. It doesn't mean it's not there, but the odds of tracking something are usually kind of low. Now, if you're playing an adventure that's outdoors and you're trying to, you know, hot on the heels of a bunch of bandits or you're trying to rescue somebody or you want to find out what happened to the caravan, a bunch of guys in the caravan are dead or um, who knows, you want to know which way the trolls are moving and the rangers scouting out and you, hey, listen, the huge army of men and two platoon of men are going around the flank here. I'm tracking their, foot, their footprints. Those things can be really, really good. So this is percentile checks where you would use, say, listen, I want to track this creature. Um, I don't think the 30-minute observation is necessary when you're tracking something you're already familiar with, like a man or an elf or a dwarf. If you're tracking like a Remorhaz, like if you're in the Remorhaz pit or you're in this area here, which is a white dragon lair, you want to see how long the last white dragon was here. Did they go down this passageway or did they fly out? You could probably do that. So that gives you some percentile rolls you can do. Excuse me. 
to uh, figure that out. Like whether it went up and down a chimney or through a concealed door, or passed through a secret door. These are all percentage chances. Outdoors, there's a 90% base chance of Ranger being able to follow a creature modified as possible for each creature above one in the party being tracked for every 24 hours it lasts between making the track and tracking so the tracking is interesting um not amazing but interesting um so that's kind of matching the theme right you think go back to aragorn and strider from lord of the rings the original book not the movie um you know strider and aragorn what do you want to call him he, he tracking ring race and tracking the movement of other people Interesting rule. So if you're underground, think about how you could utilize that to your advantage. If a ranger is paired up with a thief, the thief could, you know, hide in shadows. Let's head for Rinjar here. Say the thief was hiding shadows, went into this room, said, I see there's a white dragon in the room. Let's say the ranger's waiting here. And he, he flew, he left, he flew out the window and he went somewhere that way. And I can't tell which way he went. The, he could come back and tell you and you could come in here and you could track. And almost like a detective on the crime scene, the ranger would be able to kind of tell that, well, it looks like this white dragon eats food over here and is sitting over here and flies up out this window. And almost like you could tell what the movements were of the creature, um, even when the creature's not there. If you were trying to track down someone riding away on horseback and escaping you like an arch nemesis, um, you could do that as well. So you, you could tell if this is a bad guy you were trying to chase down. Let's just put this other character on the screen here. Um, where's this barbarian guy? So you got the barbarian guy, and he was in the room, and he climbed up this thing here and, and, and got on a Pegasus flying mount and flew out the opening and left. The ranger could come in the room and track this whole room and figure, oh, he was here and he flew away. So if you're doing that kind of gameplay in your story, the ranger could be a great detective type of a class. Uh, don't do the G.I. Joe quote for me, though, okay? <laughs> so at 8th level, the 8th level is getting pretty powerful in 1st edition. Um, you're still around 50 hit points, maybe at the most, but at 8th level, Rangers gain limited Druidic spell ability. Additional spells are added through 17th level. Now, at first, that doesn't sound like much. And if you go over here to the left here, here's the uh, the Druid table, right? Where, um, let's see, where's the Ranger table? for? Here we go. Spells usable by class and level for Ranger fighters. So... You hit level eight, you get one level one druid spell. Okay, let's pull this over here a little bit. One level one druid spell. So if you're a level 17 ranger, okay, that's incredible, epic, legendary, known throughout the realm type of ranger in first edition. You'd have two level one druid spells, two level two, and two level three. And you'd actually gain some magic user spells. That's one thing that people forget about. Because a lot of those spells are like, you cast this many magic missiles based upon your hit dice, like what level you are. So that's where things get kind of tricky. It's like, well, does that really apply to me when I'm um, a ranger at this level? This is where you need to kind of really think about how that rule is going to work. Let's go back over here again. Let me pull this up a little closer. There we go. Let me slide this down. I'm not PDFing well today. Sorry about that. There we go. I want it to be big enough so you can see without having to squint. Here we go. So you gain some spells. Yay. Whatever. Now, the thing about it is it's going to make you pick and choose wisely, right? You're going to go through the Druid spell list. You go, you know what? I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get Entangle. I don't care what you say. You know, Entangle is just one of the best spells in the game for the Druid. Fantastic, powerful spell. You know, point blank, a massive area effect you can do. You wall of fire eventually. That would be great. Whatever else you want to do. You know, the, the Ranger has... Some spells, they'd be used in a frugal way. Now, if you're playing the ranger kind of in a rural role-playing kind of way, you would probably pick some of the animal companion spells and things like that. And they did that in 3rd edition, 3.5. And I think they did in Pathfinder. And I'm not sure about 5th edition. You have to check up with the ranger on that one. Usually, they have like an animal companion you can have and things like that. I remember playing Neverwinter years ago, and it was, it was like that. So, so at level 9, you get limited use of magic user spells, and rangers cannot read druid or magic user spells from magic scrolls in any event. So you gain the spell, but you can't read it from a spell book. So it's kind of strange. Um, how do you get it? How do you learn it? So what I would always rule in that situation is like, you know, this knowledge is passed down to you from either your, your mentor, ranger, friend is, or from another magic user can teach you how to do the spell, and you can learn how to do it. You know how the aptitude, how to use magic for whatever purpose you want to do it. Um, at level, level 10, when you're called a Ranger Lord, Rangers are able to employ non-written magic items to pertain to cl uh, clairaudience, clairvoyance, ESP, and telepathy. So read this very carefully, okay? You're able to employ all non-written magic items. 
that pertain to clairaudience, clairvoyance, ESP, and telepathy. So, let's say your dungeon master gave you a gave your party a sword, okay? And a sword had an ego and it was an intelligent sword. It could speak to you. Um, and therefore, it could have intrasensory per perception or telepathy. That means that the ranger could use the magic item that has telepathy on it. Say that the party award, the DM awarded a magic ring, okay? So the, the DM says, oh, I'm going to give you a magic ring and a magic ring is normally for magic users. And the magic ring allows you to cast the spell clairaudience or clairvoyance, like hearing in the future or understanding what's going to happen in the future. Or even ESP, read someone's mind. You know, you run through the city state, the invincible overlord, and the judge, the famous judges guild module. You go to one of the bankers that's in the downtown section by the guard. You read this guy's mind, you find out he's an actual murderer. So, you know, these are magic items that become available to you when you're playing a ranger that wouldn't happen for anyone else. So later on in 3.5, they let the bard do some of these kinds of things. They use some scrolls, pick up some magic items. So in the first edition, you know, fighters are never using these things. They're only using melee weapons. They're not running around with a rod of seven parts and blasting dudes or using, uh, you know, the recorder of Yassine, one of the most famous artifacts in the game. So... The ranger gets a chance to use these things, but only would they pertain to understanding how someone thinks, how to uh, read minds, how to understand what they're, th uh, what, what they're thinking in the future, what could happen in the future, events that might unfold before you, things like that. So remember that. That's a rule a lot of times people don't pay attention to because it's very open. It's just one nice sentence with maybe 24 words. And it's very, very powerful. Let's look at this next one, number seven. Also, at 10th level, each ranger attracts a body of 2 to 24 followers. Now, you've heard me talk about this before. This is really kind of depends upon how you like to play the game, what your campaign is about. When the first edition came out, there's a lot of rules that pertain to hirelings, followers, building a castle, having a keep, attracting an army, having a barracks, all this kind of civilization, real-time strategy, world-building kind of stuff. It's cool. It is cool because, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. It's kind of basing things upon what it would be if you were a heroic person in world history. So if you were some famous lord in some county or, and, and you uh, were considered to be just and fair and whatever in your paladin, you might attract other famous paladins like, I wanted to tutor on you. You know, this is not something where someone's signing up for something on the Internet. So in the D&D world, it's word of mouth how much of a legend you are. So you attract people that want to come follow you and train underneath you because that, that the whole game has that kind of mentorship kind of a vibe going on with it. The idea is that, you know, you don't just magically have spells go shing and pop in your memory because like in EverQuest 2 or something, uh, the moment you hit level 10, you need to go meet, your, you know, talk to your mentor again, do some training. There's no ranger school in this town of Neverwinter. You know, there's nothing like that happening. So your DM is going to rule on how you get those kinds of uh, spells and stuff transferred to you. So this one here, here kind of really applies to... Um, how you want to play the game. I mean, the DM might want to make this a plot twist where, you know, you a, a body of 20 followers, like in Force Gump, want to come follow you running across America, right? So the attention, once uh, they're lost, they can never be replaced. All the mercenaries can be hired, of course. These followers are determined by the DM who, infor uh, who then informs the ranger. So, and that's what they're trying to say there is that the dungeon master determines that you become such a famous ranger after this one adventure and you finish the glacial rifter frost giant jar and you're about to embark on the, the hall, the fire giant king. But before you do, you head back to town and you sell all your stuff. And while you're in town, people heard of your exploits and, your st and what you've done. Would you sell the magic items you didn't want, the jewelry, the word gets around and people see you walk around. They see how much prowess you had. Maybe you got in a bar fight. And before you know it, you've got a bunch of dudes knocking down your door. They're like, I want to study under you and learn the ways of being being a ranger and you know it depends it's not like the highlander sean connery film but if that's something interesting to your dm this rule might apply to you most players it doesn't ever happen most players it never happens but if you're really creative and you have a really creative dm that could be a really interesting story opportunity so this is how they handle the hirelings and attracting a following like i talked about that the paladin gets the paladin gets a war horse all kinds of cool stuff the fighter gets a following so you're kind of building a feudalism kind of a setup here and that's what the ranger does with theirs it's kind of like having being a priest and having a bunch of acolytes following you around now here's some restrictions you can't have all this whoop-de-do without some restrictions right any change to non-good alignment immediately strips the ranger of all benefits and the character becomes a fighter with eight-sided hit dice ever after and can never regain ranger status that's terrible it's like getting a dui or something right and no one wants that to happen so if the ranger you're like wait a minute i can't be an evil ranger remember up here okay it says what it does say is right here, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Rangers must be of good alignment. Right there. Let's make that a little smaller so you can see it. 
pull that over here. There you go. So if you're going to play a ranger, you got to be good. You're going to play a paladin, you got to be lawful good. That's the rule. I've seen postings in some of the Facebook groups lately, uh, fifth edition players mostly, saying, hey guys, can I? how come I can't play my paladin as chaotic evil? I want to play him as an evil knight and a villain. Well, you're just really a fighter. But they want to get all the other abilities of being a paladin. You know, it depends what your DM says. I don't think of the problem with that. I think it'd be great. If I wanted to play a ranger and I want to be a chaotic, evil, terrible bastard that lived in the woods and hunted people down and killed them and, and he was a murderer and he was had psychological problems, that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But the core game... They want the ranger to be a, a, a kind of like in the Lord of the Rings. Once again, they want him to be like Aragorn, like Strider, this lawful, chaotic, or neutral good type of alignment. Um, not evil. Uh, not running around neutral. They're not neutral like druids are. Like, you know, Filcherna has to be neutral in first edition. So he's a druid in our campaign. Now let's take a look at that real quick, right? Where's Filcherna? She's down here somewhere. To play a druid in first edition, you got to be neutral. There's no and, ifs, or buts about it. That's what you're going to be playing. You're going to be considered uh, neutral. Something good happens, doesn't bother you. Something good, ha something really bad happens, doesn't bother you. Something good happens to your friend, you're kind of happy. Something bad happens to your friend, that's the circle of life. You know, it's kind of a bad thing. But when you're playing a ranger, things are very, very different. So let's go back over here to this uh, uh, other restrictions. Let's pull this in a little closer too. <clears throat> that was the first one, excuse me. Rangers may not hire any men at arms, servants, aides, or henchmen until they take 8th level or higher. So this is kind of interesting. You're like, why do they make that rule? What difference is there about level 8? So the ranger is kind of supposed to be someone who's independent. So when you're an independently themed character and you're living off the land and you're uh, doing what you want to do the way you want to do it and you're whether you're chaotic good or neutral good or you're living in Shadowdale or whatever it is you're doing, whatever your story, your personal story, your heritage or whatever it's going to be, if you're a ranger, you need to understand that you're going to go it alone and you're going to learn how to do things on your own. And later on, if you need to hire someone to help you out, you can do that. But they are not like a fighter, like Zolaris could go and hire a bunch of dudes, you know, some level five fighters to come hang out with him while he goes down an adventure, get together, and it's not a problem with him because they're considered almost, you know, additional soldiers. Ranger would never do that. So these kinds of rules here are kind of spiritual thematic ideas, and I think it's worth respecting. Um, some things in the game you'll hear me mention, you don't really need to worry about it. It's kind of up to you. We never, no one found it very useful. But some of the things like that I think are, are interesting. You know, if you're playing a fighter, you've got four minute arms with you. You've got a barbarian guy helping you out. And you've got some other elf or human dual wielder with you. And this, through your adventuring in this cavern, and you've got the ranger here, the ranger is independent. Think about how the situation would play when these two characters are talking to each other. If you're playing Baldur's Gate, the ranger wouldn't be worried about that. The ranger's worried about what's going on in the environment, what's happening in the, in the world around them. So... That stoicism is a good way to look at it. That's why I think that when Ari Salvatore wrote the Dritz Stewart novels, which are based in the Forgotten Realms, that he he always made Dritz this kind of introspective, philosophical ranger. You know, he's all by himself. He has this magical pet. He's not a summoned animal pet. This Guinevar, or how you pronounce it, Black uh, Panther. So, you know, he's probably, what, Maliki is the god I think that Dritz had. I'm not a huge Dritz fan or anything, but I have a huge respect for the fact that uh, his novels were, were uh, very popular. And, you know, that you have to have a lot of respect for that. I mean, so much time. He helped reinvigorate the game by creating a heroic character. You got to love it. So, Rangers, think about these kinds of rules. Read more into it than is really there. What they're really trying to say here, instead of saying a whole paragraph, saying the ranger is always self-sufficient, self-reliant, is uninterested in hiring others to do labor manual for themselves. The, the, the ranger doesn't mind going to woods and spending two and a half weeks creating a bow, right? Something you might see on some kind of reality show where they're living in Vancouver you know, and the islands are somewhere supposed to survive for six weeks. The ranger's like that. The fighter, he'd pay someone to do it. The fighter wants to get on with it, get back to fighting. So... Here's another one. No more than three rangers may ever operate together at any one time. Once again, what's the subtext? The subtext is that rangers are independent. If there was two rangers on the battlefield at the same time, let's say these two unpainted minis were rangers, um, they wouldn't be next to each other unless they absolutely had to defend themselves against, I don't know, let's say there's a bunch of wolves are attacking. They're being surrounded by wolves, right? They might stay toe-to-toe -to, -toe to defend each other's backs as they're fighting. This guy's mailing, this guy's using his bow, point-blank range of shooting. So they might do something like that to work together, but the moment the fight's over with and these things are all dead, Ranger 1, an independent character, which most players are, is going to run off and do what he wants this way. This guy's going to go off this way. They operate in the same area, but they aren't going to be like, for example, if you've seen some of our um, classic DM adventures, we had, where is she? 
Where is that girl? Here she is over here. Here's Elephanisi. We've had Elephanisi and Varinjar, brother and sister, older brother, younger sister, together hiding in shadows, exploring things together, staying right behind each other and protecting each other. And we've seen situations because this is a thief, this is an assassin, this is a monk. So that's not a problem for them to work together. They're siblings. If you had two rangers that were siblings or brothers or sisters or brothers or whatever, sure, they might stay close to each other, but they're going to be like at arm's length. So think of those subtexts of these rules when you start trying to figure out what does that mean for me when I'm making my character, okay? So let's go over to this other column over here. And let's bring this down a little bit. All right, four. This one right here. Let's zoom in a little bit again. Make this larger for you. This is all the restrictions now. These aren't more bonus things. Rangers may only uh, may own may own only those goods and treasure which they can carry on their person, and or place them on their mount. All excess must be donated to a worthy communal or institutional cause. Oh, excuse me, that's the paladin, isn't it? No, no, that's ranger. It's still ranger. It's kind of like the paladin. It's kind of like, hey, I got these. Uh, I got a chest full of rubies, and I got this awesome staff, and I got this great bow, and I have a secondary crossbow, and I got a halberd, and a scimitar, and a katana. Dude, he's not going to keep any of that. He's oh, I can use the cro I can use a bow, but I don't want the crossbow. So think of it that way. It's like he I can only keep it with on his horse that he needs. It's almost like a gunslinger. You know, think of Clint Eastwood and riding across the desert of Arizona, hunting down bounty hunters or whatever. It's kind of self-sufficient, self-reliant, on the move, vagabond hunter type of character and that's what they're all about um all the rangers this all the rangers do not attract a body of mercenaries to serve them when and if rangers construct strongholds they conform to the fighter class in these respects so this is a rule that's in the dm guide we can talk about in a later episode and like i said before there's a lot of rules in first edition that talk about having a stronghold attracting followers building a small city or a town um this is basically telling you that if you start doing that kind of stuff, you're going to follow the same rules as the fighter. So here you go. Here's the titles. This is one thing they did in first edition I thought was quite, quite cool. Um, whether it's stuck or not, I don't know. But look at the name, number two. You're a level two ranger. You can call yourself a strider. So isn't that ironic, right? So they have titles like courser and tracker and guide, pathfinder. Hey, that's ironic. Level seven, lucky seven. Um, ranger, ranger knight, ranger lord, et cetera, et cetera. And then below that, they tell you how much experience you need. This one here, Rangers gain two hit points after level 10. I bunk that. Just don't don't even do it. If, if the monsters are getting higher level, boost those hit dice, a Demigorgon, these other nasties they're going to fight one day. Make sure the Orcus is powerful. You know, don't, fighting a Calavdra and things like that, make sure those characters are powerful. Let the character, let the player get that eight hit dice every single level they go above level 10. It doesn't matter. And here's why I say that. Look how much experience it takes to get from level 10 to 11, okay? To get from level 10 to get to level 11, you need, you need to go from 325 total accumulated experience in one to 650,000. So what is that, 325,000 experience? That's a lot. Um, and remember, I don't do gold piece uh, gem value uh, experience. I don't think that you don't become more experience picking up money. Uh, or things of value. You get more experience by killing things, do things, exploring things, achieving things, defeating challenges, thinking, playing the game. Playing the game experience gets you, uh, you know, vanquishing the uh, you know, G2, vanquishing the Hidden Shrine of Tomoshan or Tumaharas. Those things should garner you a level or two of experience. So um, when you see these rules, like you see at level 11, it says, oh, eight sided dice for accumulated hit points, eight, 11 plus two. So a level 12 ranger. Is only going to have a maximum of six hit points higher than a level 10 ranger? I don't think. Not a line. No, I don't think so. That's ridiculous. So the original game was balanced, was an offshoot of chain mail and a miniature war game. And so some of these hit dice numbers, they became very restrictive and very small once you hit level 10. Um, if you play the way that um, I suggest you play, which is, hey, you got a hill giant on the screen? Give this guy max health. You got a hill giant uh, soldier? Give him a little extra health. He's, leave the AC the same, leave the hit rolls the same, boost this guy's health, boost this guy, give you the character max health with a constitution bonus. You're a level 12 ranger, that's 12 times 8, which is what, 96 hit points, plus your constitution bonus. He might have a plus 1 constitution, another 12, put him at 102 hit points. He's fighting a, you know, a, 40, a 50 and a 50 hit dice, 50 hit points, hill giant, that's nasty. He gets that bonus to do damage for being level 10, 
I mean, it's going to be an exciting fight. There'll be a lot of killing, and who doesn't want to see exciting, big, powerful rolls happen? It doesn't necessarily mean I want to make the game my own damage numbers. If you're going to raise the monster health, raise the player health the same. Now, if you want to play it the old school way, where you roll the hit side, the dice for the character every time you level up, you get four hit points one level. You could roll three twos in a row. And imagine going from level seven to level ten and only gaining six hit points. Okay, you end up getting killed. You wouldn't be able to do the Temple of Elemental Evil at all. All that fun adventure you wanted to have, you're not very much of a hero at all. You just remained a limp-wristed punk that never got stronger than level 7. So that's something to think about. All the classes do have these types of rules in them. You'll see it on um, the Druid. And here, here's the Paladin, right? The Paladin's like, oh, beyond level 10, you only gain 3 and then 6 hit points. I, I just think you should just don't do that. I just give them the max hit points and run with them there. So... Um, this is the spell list. So remember, they get Druid and Magic user spells. Ranger must check as to which spells he or she can learn just as if she were a Magic user. You know, there's a very restrictive rule in First Edition about how Magic users get their spells. They have a chance to memorize. They get a spell book in front of them. They memorize a the spell. They try casting it. It doesn't work. You know, whether you want to do that or not, it's kind of up to you. The spell system in the first edition is, I'm pretty sure it's the same way in the fifth edition, where, hey, I've got Magic Missile memorized five times. I can't cast it ten times. I can cast it five times, and I've forgotten how to cast it again. Kind of a harsh rule, but if you think about it, it's kind of like substituting for mana or action points. Listen, I've got enough mana to cast Magic Missile five times, and I can't do it anymore. So I always liked it that way. There's a, there's a formal name for that way of casting spells, but think of it as... Um, how much ammunition you can have. So they're mentioning that kind of stuff there. Here's another point. This is the attacks per melee round. So fighters, rangers, and paladin. This table gets missed a lot. Not a lot of people pay attention to this because in first edition, okay, let's say you're a level 10 ranger. In fact, let's do it this way. Let's do it right here. Let's get this all these guys out of the way. What are you doing here on the board? All right? Level 10 ranger. And what do we got here? Level 10 bar, a level 10 fighter. And what else we got? Let's say let's say it's a paladin in the party. I'm just going to use Antola. Let's say it's a level 10 paladin. And say all three of them are using a longsword. Okay. Level 10 fighter. From level 7 to 12, get three attacks every two rounds. Okay. So they call it three over two. Level 10 uh, uh, fighter, 7 over 12, 3 over 2. That's this guy down here, 3 over 2. Ranger, level 7 to 12, 3 over 2. So basically it's the same. What does that mean, 3 over 2? So you have two melee rounds, round number 1, round number 2, right? The first round, yeah, over these two rounds, you get two attacks the first round and one the second round. Or one attack the first round and two attacks. But the sum of these, okay, ha cannot exceed three over two. So two plus one is three. So in these two rounds here, okay, you can only have a maximum of three attacks going off. It's up to you as to when to do it. You need to call it before you do your die roll. So what well, you may want to say something like, well, I'm going to take my ranger, I'm going to take one shot with my bow, and I'm going to pull out my longsword, and when the guy gets close to me, I'm going to do two chops real quick on my, my, my longsword. Or you can say, I'm going to take my bow out, I've got my bow ready, I'm going to go boom, boom, and shoot the bow twice really, really quickly. Or if you're playing a paladin, and you've got a two-handed sword or a longsword out, I'm going to rush forward and go wham, wham, and hit that guy over the head twice. You know, a magic user is in the back casting spells, you want him to stop doing that. You get a ranger, you go boom, boom, pop this guy twice. You're the, you're the warrior, you run forward and do your two attacks up front. Get this guy low. Maybe you save the second attack from the guy's set and low on health. So that's basically what that rule is talking about. It's a little confusing when you see it. This three over two, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean 1.5 attacks in two rounds. Okay, so that's for all fighters, paladins, and rangers. The same exact value. So there's no advantage of playing a uh, um, a ranger over a fighter because in in 3.5 and third edition, the number of attacks around was different. I think it was. For, for dual wielding, it's different. All right, so this is talking about any thrusting or strike weapon, not with uh, bow weapons, but I always said it doesn't matter. Um, this excludes melee combat with monsters of less than one hit dice, non-exceptional, zero-light humans, demi-humans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's rules in there you can look at, and that's pretty much it for the ranger. So in summary, let's talk about one last quick thing here before we go any further. If you're going to play a ranger, what is the gotta have it's here? The thing that the ranger can do is the surprise, the flat-footedness, and never being surprised. This rule here is fantastic. The bonus of damage against giant class humanoids. They surprise your opponents and never be surprised. Tracking is not that useful. 
The ability to use a couple of Druid spells is great at high levels, but it won't affect you when you're level 7. Okay? Um, attracting henchmen and, stuff like, and, and followers, that isn't that useful. Be, the number of attacks per round you get is the same for all the fighters and the paladins and everything else. So, you know, there you go. There you have it in a nutshell. So it's really taking the ranger from Lord of the Rings, making him pretty... He's relatively tame. He's not running around casting off spells. He doesn't get a free animal companion like you do in 3.5. But there's a couple of the surprise and a few attacks. Um, a great DPSer. Is it worth giving up the, uh, the hit points for that? Uh, I don't know. It's really up to you. The fighter with the fire decides to use a bow as well. The thing the ranger is going to be able to do is the ranger is really, really, really going to be suited. The ranger is going to out damage this fighter. The fighter and the ranger stand side by side. And they both shoot these two hill giants. The ranger is going to win because the ranger is going to do additional damage to higher level he is. He can do 10 extra damage at level 10 versus this guy. So it really helps make up for the fact that ranger doesn't need a lot of magic items to do a lot of additional damage. Okay, we're going to wrap that up right now. We've been going on for about uh, 45 minutes, but that's the ranger in a nutshell. There is a lot of cool potential to that class. You should think about it if you want to play one. I do believe there are armor restrictions for that class. I can't remember. I have to look it up. You can look it up yourself in the player handbook. As always, remember, the uh, ranger had to wear light or medium armor. Um, I'm not going to waste five minutes of your time looking it up. It depends how you want to play your campaign. I don't think they're restricted to leather. They could be. I've, I've forgotten. It's been a while. I haven't played a ranger personally since 1982. <laughs> so they have never been one of my favorite classes, but they're very, very powerful if you want to play something that really epitomizes that giant killer type of a range class or melee class. They have some restrictions on what they can use. They don't run around on plate mail. But, uh, but that's it. Uh, if you like this episode, you know, like, subscribe, give comments, make a comment on the website. I've recently moved everything from the Patreon page to my personal author website. And uh, the next up, we'll talk about the magic users, then illusionists and thieves and assassins. And uh, have fun. And I hope you're having a good time exploring the game. And, and if you have any questions about any of these rulings and you want to add some clarifications that I missed and I got wrong, hey, be sh feel free to do it. Because the more knowledge you share with everyone, the more everyone can appreciate the game. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon. See you later.